Tenarque, Tacuta John, Castello. Mortemihi, Farkamorheo. Na, Mihi, Nuiki Aokoto, Katoa. Korm Kemzi Ninsas Aho. Nor, Aroteroa, Aho. Tenarkoto, 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 Katoa. Today, I am going to talk about how different attitudes and assumptions can lead to unexpected outcomes or exceptional adventures. This phrase, it is all about attitude, was something my dad said all the time when I was a teenager. By this, my dad meant, no matter what situation you find yourself in, what counts is how you choose to respond to it. More recently, my mum and I discovered another way of looking at attitude. We read a book called The Power. Rhonda Byrne, the author, explains how creating a mindset or adopting an attitude is like getting on a horse. If you wake up in the morning feeling miserable, you can change the way you feel. You can make a conscious effort to be happy. It's called getting off the grumpy horse and climbing onto the happy horse or any other horse you like. When I started writing my presentation, I thought that you could divide horses into two categories, those that play in the paddock of positivity and those that reside in the negativity stables. However, the more I reflected on my almost 25 years of life experience, the more I realized our genetics, memories, experiences, and aspirations make us who we are, and they all affect our attitude. So, the way I like to think about it is our genetics, memories, and aspirations make up the grass in our paddock. Meanwhile, our current experiences form what the weather is like in our paddock. Most days bring unremarkable weather, but every so often we experience something which sends pouring rain or warm sunshine into our paddock. Some horses make their presence more apparent when the sun is shining, while other horses stand out in the rain. For example, if someone is suffering from anxiety, the anxiety could be considered a storm. So, the storm would affect all of the horses, making some horses, such as the horses, called sadness and worry, more powerful, and making some horses, such as the happy horse, more elusive. However, even in the worst weather, I believe that there is a happy horse still somewhere in the field. Subsequently, while people can make a conscious effort to change the horse they want to be on, their desired horse may be elusive or lost in the crowd, and thus some people have limited horses to pick from. Feel free to think about what horses you have in your own paddock. Maybe you will find yourself on the open-minded horse or the horses of enjoyment and entertainment throughout this presentation. As I was preparing this presentation, I decided I needed to be on a horse called Just Do It, the Horse of Productivity. However, I found that some other horses were trying to run interference. These horses included Right Words, a horse of perfection, and You Can't Do This, the horse of self-doubt. It was only when I began to think about the gym, a place where the phrase You Can't Do This is not allowed, I found myself 
on the speech writing horse. This is because for me, the gym is a paddock full of fun, motivation, and laughter. For example, at the beginning of this year, the 3rd of January, to be precise, my personal trainer unknowingly channeled Glenda Watson Hyatt, the previous outstanding consumer lecturer, asking me what my big, hairy, audacious goal, otherwise known as my B-H-A-G, would be for 2018. He added that he wanted an answer in one week. Laughing, I said, how about I give you an answer in a fortnight, as I am away next week. Relieved that I had bought myself some extra time over the next two weeks. I asked my family and friends what they thought. Yet, nobody could come up with anything that sounded big, hairy or audacious enough. In reality, I already knew the answer and I was on the horse of denial. Knowing that my personal trainer would hold me accountable, it was important to me that I began actively working towards my goal. Subsequently, the day before I went back to the gym, I sent out my CV to a few places. My big goal for 2018 was to find employment. It is ironic that my personal trainer made me face the daunting prospect of finding a new job given that when I started working with my personal trainer, I made a decision, a decision best summed up by this quote by Dr. Bailey from Grey's Anatomy, one of my favorite TV shows. Deciding to leave my first job was not hard, as I understood I was not the right fit for the organization. However, it was a painful decision for many reasons. For as long as I can remember, I have had the desire to get a job and work, and I was so proud when I got my first job. So, I saw resigning as a massive failure. Furthermore, many of my family and friends did not initially agree with my decision to leave, assuming I would regret it. That is the problem with assumptions, they are often wrong. While I never assumed that I would leave nine months after starting the job, I have never regretted for a single second having the courage to say I'm not okay with what's going on and therefore I need to walk away. Talking about assumptions, let's talk politics. Four years ago, who would have ever assumed that a very controversial entrepreneur turned celebrity would get one of the most important jobs in the world? It appears that most of the world have been riding horses of a denial, disbelief, and absolute incredulity when it comes to the 45th President of the United States. The more controversial the Republican presidential nominee became, the more the media seemed to favor Hillary Clinton. As a communications graduate, having studied the media and knowing that what they tell us is not always the whole truth, I should know better than to trust the word of the media. However, given the surprising results of the British general election and the Brexit referendum in the years and months prior, I assumed that the media and the companies conducting the polls would not want to be caught off guard again. For this reason, I believe the predictions reported by the media would be fairly accurate. You have to wonder how many people chose not to vote because, just like me, they had assumed Hillary Clinton would win 
based on what the media was reporting. In fact, Hillary Clinton has said herself one of the contributing factors to her losing the election was that many young women did not turn out and vote, assuming that she wouldn't need their vote. Similarly, a year ago, many New Zealanders would have never assumed that they would have a Prime Minister on maternity leave. In fact, I seriously doubt Jacinda Ardern herself ever assumed that she would tick off multiple life-changing milestones within less than a year. Assuming that nothing could upset their dramatic lead in the polls and assuming they would have coalition partners to rely on seems to have been the undoing of New Zealand's National Party's quest to get elected for a fourth term. We can only assume, in hindsight, the National Party would have changed their campaigning and negotiating tactics. On a more personal note, throughout my life, there have been many assumptions made about me and I have made quite a few myself. From the moment I was born, my parents knew that something was not quite right. Nevertheless, they always assumed that I had the same intellectual understanding and capabilities as my sisters. However, when it has come down to being treated like anybody else, not everybody has been on the same horse or page as my family. Given it's the 21st century, there is an assumption that society is fully inclusive now. However, a shift in societal attitude takes generations, and thus, there are still many assumptions and attitudes us in the disability community need to challenge. For example, I went to my local high school, just like my sisters. Every new student did an academic test, and based on the results, you got sorted into your main class, where you were supposed to stay for your first two years of school. However, I ended up moving classes at the end of my first year, because as my family later found out, I got placed in my original class, not based on my test results, but based on the school's assumption that I may not cope with the workload of high school. Similarly, most students choose their university based on what courses they want to do. Instead, I hopped onto the horse of practicality and my choice came down to which university would give me the extra time I needed to complete my exams and which campus was most wheelchair accessible. In that situation, it was clear that I needed to be on the horse of practicality, but as I mentioned earlier, sometimes it may be hard to find the right horse at the right time. Alternatively, some horses may be vestrals. For those of you who haven't heard of vestrals, they are mythical horses which appear in J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter books. Known for their unattractive appearance and only seen by those who have witnessed death, Vestrals are perceived to be scary and a representation of misfortune. However, as Harry Potter learns, once you see past their initial appearance, you discover their true nature and worth. Firstly, I share the misunderstood nature of Thestrals. Many people who don't know me still assume that I have an intellectual disability just by looking at me. It is only after people spend time with me they discover somebody who has an unusual taste in music, somebody who needs physical help but knows her own mind, somebody 
who has worked hard to get a Bachelor of Communication and a Master of Business Studies, somebody who has a cheeky sense of humor, somebody who is more of a wild horse than my little pony. Secondly, in the context of our horse metaphor, Thestrals are those horses that you don't know you need to ride until there is a crisis and you have no choice but to be on their back. For example, nine years ago, it was discovered I had a folic acid deficiency. The horses of curiosity were nowhere to be found as nobody ever thought it might be a symptom of something more. When I became suddenly unwell with abdominal pain, the doctors assumed that I had appendicitis and removed my appendix accordingly. However, as my condition continued to deteriorate, it was suggested to my parents that I could have swine, flu, or that the surgeons may have done damage when they took out my appendix. My condition deteriorated to the point that I required a ventilator to breathe for me and the doctors decided to do emergency exploratory surgery then scans concerned that if they did the scans first I would become too unstable to operate on. Unfortunately, neither the surgery or scans provided any answers. After mysteriously recovering and spending a total of 10 days in the high dependency unit, it was assumed that I most likely had some type of virus. It was not until I left the hospital knowing I needed to figure out the truth. I jumped onto the horse of curiosity. After some research and experiencing some less dramatic symptoms, my GP ordered a blood test. The results were undeniable. To be considered to have celiac disease, the blood test needs to come back over 10. My test results came back at over 40. No wonder I had been so ill. As somebody who bears the physical scars of the mostly invisible autoimmune disorder, it is quite bemusing that some people still assume the gluten-free diet is a fad. However, on a positive note, my scars mean that I am never tempted to cheat on my diet. Earlier that same year, I appeared on a New Zealand TV show about people who have disabilities coincidentally called Attitude. For whatever reason, my story stood out to the people involved in the production of the show. So, at the second annual Attitude Awards, they named me Attitude Person of the Year. This award has evolved now into the Spirit of Attitude Award. There aren't many teenagers who receive awards for attitude. Let's face it, at 16, you are more likely to win an award for bad attitude. And bad attitude, by the way, is a horse you never want to spend much time on, if any. Seriously though, I couldn't understand why my attitude towards life was anything but ordinary. Throughout my life, I have met many people who are incredibly humble and who feel like they don't deserve recognition or limelight. These people will probably never win an award or get mentioned in the Queen's Birthday Honours. Nevertheless, they excel in their chosen role through compassion, skill and enthusiasm, amongst other traits. In New Zealand, a well-known Maori saying is, he, aha, te menui or te, oh, he, 
Tungita, he, Tungita, he, Tungita. In English, this means, what is the most important thing in the world? It is the people, it is the people, it is the people. The reason why I am bringing this saying up is although my own attitude has helped get me to where I am today, more important has been the attitude of people around me. There are many people in my life I shall never be able to thank enough. They have not only helped me become the person I am today, but they are determined I will succeed in my chosen endeavors with every fiber of their being. For example, my parents have always had the attitude that my disability would not prevent my family from traveling. We regularly travel to different parts of New Zealand. The first airplane trip I remember was to Christchurch to spend time with my mum's cousin and her family. One of the highlights was going canoeing on the Avon. Since then, I have been lucky enough to travel further afield. With my family, I have been to Singapore and some places in Australia, America, Europe and the Pacific. Traveling with a disability is often assumed to be difficult. While it can be difficult at times, it can also be amusing. Not all stories are funny at the time, but they get more humorous upon reflection. There was the time, for example, that mum booked a motel with a pool only for us to arrive and discover that there were 101 steps between the pool and a room. Other adventures come through needing wheelchair access. For example, I have seen inside the Queen's personal post office at Windsor Castle because it's along the wheelchair accessible route. The trip I probably enjoyed the most was going to Orlando to visit a friend working at Disney World. Nothing comes close to rivaling the magic of Disney. A lot of people continue to assume that people with physical or other disabilities cannot be adventurous. Although traveling in theme parks have provided me with great adventure over the years, I have had many adventures back home in Aotearoa. From when I was little, I have always loved the water and anything to do with it. When I was a teenager, I would be the person volunteering first to biscuit behind the back of a boat. Given that I cannot hold on at all, I think that counts as serious adventure. Subsequently, when somebody suggested I try sailing in my first year of university, I was excited to give it a go. Given sailing a boat is not the easiest thing to do when you are able-bodied, and I am not the world's greatest wheelchair driver, my family wondered if sailing would be doable. However, thanks to other people's inclusive and encouraging attitudes, sailing has become a massive part of my life. Knowing that many people struggle to imagine me sailing, here is a video. But now she's got the wind at her back and the sun on her face. And she's ready for whatever comes her way. So now she knows she can laugh and learn from her mistakes. She won't ever let the past rule today. And that's what makes this crazy life worth living Cause every day is a new beginning Now she's got the wind at her back And the sun on her face And she's ready for whatever comes her way Cause now she knows she 
can laugh and learn from her mistakes. She won't ever let the past rule today. And that's what makes this crazy life worth living. Cause every day is a new beginning. From the man who invented a sailboat which rarely capsizes and can be controlled with a joystick to the sailability teams throughout New Zealand helping me to get on the water. There are just so many people with great attitude who have given me amazing opportunities. These people are like, if we can think of a way to do it, let's actually do it that way. Through sailing, I have had the opportunity to meet a variety of people. For example, I met some of my best friends when they said, come to Taupo, we are doing a sailing regatta and you can come with us in one of our boats. You can experience a regatta without having to do it yourself. How many people who struggle to communicate would think it's a good idea to spend a weekend sailing with complete strangers you got introduced to on Facebook. My horse of trust must have been working overtime that weekend enabling me to enjoy the experience. Sailability Hawks Bay has a motto which sums up their attitude, ability, is no limit to adventure. I had the privilege of embracing this motto last year when I was invited to sail as part of a 24-hour event. Many people were involved with the event because every two hours the boats docked back at the wharf to rotate sailors. After all, nobody is really crazy enough to sail for 24 hours straight, are they? Hang on, I'm in it. I am crazy enough to write a master's thesis using my toe. I am crazy enough to go sailing with a bunch of strangers and I am crazy enough to agree to sit here in front of you all and deliver this presentation. So, I think we all know that I have a crazy horse running around completely wild in my paddock. For this reason, when my friend decided that she was going to sail for 24 hours straight by herself and then asked me to do the same, I didn't hesitate. My only hesitation was finding a caregiver who wanted to come along for the adventure, which I eventually did. We set off at noon on Saturday, the 4th of February. During the 24 hours, I only hopped out of my boat once, and that was to go to the bathroom, which I think is pretty reasonable. My friends and I have had a few other great adventures. Sometimes my friends take me on adventures as their guinea pig. For example, we did a series of zip lines in Rotorua to see if it was an activity worth recommending to other friends. They took me along, knowing that I am the lightest and the most flexible. Very quickly, we ascertained that these zip lines would not be suitable for our other friends. For a start, access was only possible along bushwalks that were sometimes not even foot-friendly, let alone wheelchair-friendly. Similarly, a friend and I recently visited Tiritiri, Matangi, an island near Auckland. Between an all-terrain wheelchair and people power, I managed to get around, but it definitely was not easy. My friends have also introduced me to skiing, which my family also had their doubts about. 
while I never doubted there would be a way for me to ski, I was nervous about going on a chairlift. My nerves dated back to Peter Pan's flight, a ride at Disneyland. Throughout that particular ride, my cousin could feel my body tensing, so she kept asking me if I was okay, and I kept nodding yes. As soon as we were off the ride, I burst into tears, and my legs started shaking. I still have no idea why, really, but this previous experience didn't fill me with confidence regarding going on another chairlift. We were all keen to see how I would react. After going down the baby slope a lot, it was time to go up the chairlift. And it was absolutely fine. In saying this, the way the Sitsuki works, getting onto and off the chairlift is always a heart in the mouth kind of moment. However, I do tend to get used to the sensation the more I do it. I need guides, also known as bucketers, to help me ski, but I have some control through shifting my body weight from side to side. I am so grateful for all of the volunteers who have helped me ski and sail over the years. The most interesting part about adventures is every adventure is different. You can never repeat an adventure, the weather, the company, something is always different. For example, I skied in Wanaka last year I think, we skied four days straight. Anyway, my guides and I were doing the most advanced sitski run by the first afternoon and I loved every moment. On the final day there, I wiped out every time we attempted this particular ski run, which may have been due to there being fresh, powdery snow that day. After wiping out on the third attempt, I gave up on that run. Because I don't know how many stories I have heard begin with, it was my last, or I just wanted to do it one more time. These stories never seem to end well. As much as I like to be on the horse of adventure, this example shows I am also a fan of the horse of caution. My friends and I know all too well the price of adventure. Earlier, I mentioned that I was involved in a 24-hour sailing event. This event was a memorial event to remember Sam, a fellow sailor. Sam wanted to complete an Ultraman event, which is like an extreme marathon. Very sadly, Sam passed away after an accident while training for this unique adventure. As much as we wish Sam could be here having more adventures with us, my friends and I have to treasure the memories we do have and know that he would want us to keep showing the world ability is no limit to adventure. Knowing that we had previously discussed doing a 24-hour sailing event and Sam had been keen, it just felt like the right way for our small sailing community to remember him. My cautious nature also came to the forefront last November when I was taking part in a sailing regatta. We were sailing on Lake Naruto, a small lake just outside Hamilton, New Zealand, and one of my favorite places to sail. The day before the regatta, we were practicing, and the weather was beautiful. It was weather for t-shirts, shorts, and sunscreen. The next day, though, was completely different, overcast and windy, extremely windy. The ultimate test of how windy it is, 
is how wet my arms are afterwards because I rarely keep my arms inside the boat. If my arms are dry, it means that my boat has stayed relatively flat through lack of wind, and if my arms are wet, it means that my boat has been leaning over quite a lot. My petite size, helpful in other adventures, means that it takes less wind for my boat to lean over. On this day, I was sailing with small sails because of the wind, but my boat was still leaning over quite a lot. When we finished the first two races, we headed back to the shore to have lunch. As soon as I had my communication device, I said, it is too windy I don't want to go back out after lunch. My parents and fellow sailors all thought I was crazy and tried to say that we could just make the sails even smaller and reassured me that I would be fine. Maybe I was being extra cautious given these are the bruises I got on my legs the first time I sailed at Lake Naruto. In the end, I didn't go back out after lunch. But, you know what? Neither did my fellow sailors. Funnily enough, the race committee ruled that it was too windy. Sometimes, all you can say is, I told you so. Additionally, adventures are always an opportunity to learn. For example, if I ever sail at night again, I have learnt I would quite like a headlamp. My sailing coaches have also learnt to check that my joystick is in the right position. At a recent regatta, I broke my joystick and they had to replace it. Then everyone was wondering why my boat was doing the opposite to what I wanted it to do. Eventually, I managed to communicate that they had positioned the new joystick upside down. Before I go, I must thank a few people. Thank you to the entire Isaac team, especially John, who has had the job of mentoring me while battling temperamental emails. Thank you to my mum who has read several dozen drafts, and thank you to my family and friends for providing the stories in my presentation and for listening to me practice. Thank you also to my caregiver, Aileen, the TalkLink, Trust, and Assistive Technology Alliance, New Zealand, for making this trip possible. Most importantly, Thank you to all of you for coming and listening. Never did I assume that I would have the honor of delivering the 2018 Isaac Consumer Lecture. My attitude was, if I don't submit a proposal for the Consumer Lecture, my speech therapist of 21 years will be disappointed that I haven't tried, not wanting anybody to climb onto a horse of disappointment, I wrote and submitted a proposal without a second thought, not expecting it to turn into the adventure it has been. Also, you may be wondering how I am going with my big, hairy, audacious goal. On the same day that I told my personal trainer about being chosen to present this lecture, I had some other news to share. After a six-week application, interview and trial process, I have been offered a contract simplifying documents. My new job is casual, meaning I only work if I am needed. While I am still looking for a more permanent role, I have arguably achieved my 2018 goal. In saying this, I have no plan to get on the 
complacent horse, so I am keen to think about my next goal and what kind of horses I need in my paddock to achieve it. However, the most important question is, could you be riding beside me? After all, whether it is challenging assumptions, finding the right attitude, or having adventures. He, aha, temenu te. Oh. He, tangita, he, tangita, he, tangita.